welcome everybody. Um, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon for our um, webinar series with global universities. And um, I think it's really appropriate that our first university is Sciences Po. And we have Sophie Colette here, um, who is the um, uh, representative to India from Sciences Po. And she's going to um, introduce the university and tell us more you know, about the programs. But I think it is one of really one of the, mo the you know, sort of premier global um, institutions in the world. And so I think it's really appropriate that we're starting with that. Um, I also just want to say a little bit about um, the Red Pen. So I'm Kim Dixit. I'm the um, CEO and co-founder of the Red Pen. And my partner, Namita Mehta, is also on here. Um, she's the president. And we um, have been consulting uh, on education-related issues and questions for the last nine years in Mumbai. Um, and also just servicing um, families and students all around the world. So though we are based in Mumbai, we have always been a global company and always been sort of helping everyone everywhere. So again, I think um, this time uh, in the world is strange for everyone. It's even strange for us, but fortunately we are set up and ready to, to um, pivot into the uh, sort of more virtual space, which we've been doing for a while. Um, I think the first thing I want to do before I let so hand it over to Sophie is lay down some ground rules. So what we're going to do, um, the format of our program today is just, um, like I said, Sophie is going to speak about Sciences Po. She's going to go through some of the, talk about some of its unique features and some of the things that applicants need to know. And then um, we are going to stop for some Q&A. So as you can see at the bottom of your screen um, on Zoom, you have a Q&A um, sort of, uh, box. <laughs> so if you click on that box, you can put any questions in there at any point. Um, you don't have to wait until the end, put your questions in at any point, and then we will go through them and sort of collate um, the ones because I'm sure we're going to get repeat questions. I don't think that people can see each other's questions. So we will collate the questions and then get, let Sophie answer the questions. So um, I think that is it. I think I've covered everything um, that I need to in terms of housekeeping rules, right, Namita? Yep, all good. Okay, great. So I'm gonna hand it over to Sophie and let her um, say a little bit more about um, Sciences Po. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Kim. Thanks so much, Namita, and, and all the team at the Red Pen for organizing this. Uh, just before uh, we started the webinar, I was telling Kim and Namita that it's my first time so I'm, I'm really happy and being, be, I'm also honored to be the first uh, guest uh, mm -hmm. of the Red Pen for this. Um, so I think I'm going to share uh, my screen with you because it's uh, always uh, um, more interactive like that. Uh, so, so is it the one? Yeah, I think it's this one that I want. And then... No. Okay. Can you see? Uh, can you see the the first page of uh, of the slideshow? Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. I can. <laughs> <laughs> so I I guess it means the others can yes. as well. Um, so I always start uh, uh, with a little explanation about the name because it's not transparent in English. Uh, the Po of, stand, uh, of Sciences Po stands for political. Uh, so in French, the order of the words is reversed. Uh, and uh, uh, actually, initially, the university was founded to be a school of political science. And uh, uh, in French, uh, uh, so we say Sciences Politique and the students made the name shorter and were calling it Sciences Po and the university became famous under that name. So we changed uh, the original name, which was much longer and we kept Sciences Po. So that's, uh, that's the, um, all the history of, uh, of the name. So a little bit about the university because uh, I don't know uh, like who knows what. I'm not going to go through all this in detail, but uh, maybe just share a little bit about the, the history. So we were created in 1872 after France lost a war against Prussia and uh, uh, the government, the French government asked our founder, Emile Boutmy to create a school uh, for political science. 
But since then, like we grew a lot, uh, we grew uh, in numbers. As you can see now, we have 14,000 students. We also grew in terms of the disciplines taught. Uh, we don't concentrate anymore only on political science, but we offer social sciences at large. Something else uh, about the university, uh, we have approximately half of the students who come from outside France. We don't require any French uh, for admission. Actually, now we have more than half of our programs also, which are entirely taught in English, so no worries for the language. And uh, uh, we are ranked uh, this year the sec second best university worldwide uh, for politics and international relations. This is by uh, QS rankings by subject. So the rest of the slide, I will uh, leave it for now, but in case you have any questions later, of course, uh, I, can, I can answer. Uh, so Sciences Po, I think, is really famous uh, generally because uh, all the French presidents uh, since uh, the 80s have uh, studied at Sciences Po. Uh, the third photo that you see on the screen, Nicolas Sarkozy is the only one who actually didn't graduate. He went to Sciences Po, but he didn't get the degree. And um, the legend has it that it, it was because his uh, English level was not good enough. Uh, we also know that he was already involved in politics, but uh, uh, so that's probably a mix of, of the two reasons. But on the left part, on the first photo, uh, you would recognize uh, Emmanuel Macron, our current president. Before that was François Hollande. Then Nicolas Sarkozy, Jacques Chirac, François Mitterrand. We are at the beginning of the 80s. And between the last two photos, there was actually one president who didn't go to Sciences Po. <laughs> so uh, that, that's, uh, that's, of course, our star alumni. Uh, at the end of the presentation, I have added other profiles of alumni. In case we have the time, I'll show you other examples, including people uh, in India or people from India. But yeah, for just this short presentation, I'm, I'm giving you our like bigger, biggest names. Um, closer to India, like the former president uh, of Sri Lanka, Chandrika Kumaratunga, she also uh, studied at Sciences Po. She did her PhD at Sciences Po. So this is for our alumni. Uh, since I know that the audience today uh, is uh, more interested in undergraduate studies, I will focus on that in case some people have questions about uh, master's programs. Uh, I, I will, of course, uh, answer everything you're interested in. So first, uh, where uh, do students study at the undergraduate level? So this is a map of France. Um, the capital, Paris, uh, uh, is in the north, uh, in the center north. Uh, I have put a cross on it because Paris is our master's campus. So we still have a small undergraduate program there, but it's fully taught in French. Uh, so I don't think, and it's not accessible to uh, international admissions. So that's why I have like uh, deleted it uh, uh, from, um, from the map. Uh, but otherwise, we have six other campuses which are open. And uh, the three campuses that are circled on the map offer uh, English taught programs. So to be like honest, like uh, um, all our Indian students go there, uh, though we don't uh, decide for them. So in case uh, you have proficiency in French uh, language, you are welcome to join any other uh, campus. So the students choose uh, their campus. Um, how do they choose? Uh, first, the, the language of instruction. So I was telling you uh, English in the three campuses that are circled. For the three other campuses, French language is necessary and sometimes another language. For example, the Nancy campus on the, in the east of France, then you have to speak, uh, there you have to speak French, German, and English. Uh, or for the Poitiers campus, which is the one on the west part in orange color, uh, Europe and Latin America campus, uh, there you have to speak uh, French, English, and Spanish or Portuguese. So for the three English-speaking programs, um, 
in these three campuses. So now we have like shortlisted these three. How do you choose? Well, uh, each campus has a specific regional focus. Uh, it means that certain classes, but not all classes, are dedicated to this area of the world. And as you can see, it's never only one area. It's always Europe with another zone, another region, another continent. So for example, in Le Havre, northwest of France, we have the Europe and Asia campus. Um, in Reims, we have the Europe and North America campus. This is uh, northeast from Paris, the, the pink um, square. And then on the Mediterranean coast, at, right at the south, like Green Square, uh, we have uh, the Menton campus focusing on Europe, Middle East, and Mediterranean countries. So the students choose where they want to apply. We don't decide for them. Uh, it's really according to their interests and their passion rather than their own origins. So of course, like we have more Indian students in Le Havre uh, because naturally students feel uh, uh, drawn to um, studying their own region, but you don't have to choose this one. It's entirely up to you. And I was telling you, it's always Europe and another continent because we want to give you an European perspective. We think that's also why your students join us. And that's also the way we imbibe international relations uh, in our curriculum. Okay, is everything clear? Yes? Uh, so here I've just included a few pictures. So this is uh, uh, Le Havre campus. So it's right uh, on the seashore. You have a view of the, on the docks of the harbor. It's, uh, uh, it's a city with a very big harbor, actually. Uh, we have the campus, uh, the campus in Reims, Reims uh, focusing on Europe and North America which is actually uh, set in an old monastery. It's a very, very beautiful place. It has been converted in a campus uh, like uh, uh, 15 years ago, uh, but it's a historical monument. And uh, the Middle East and Mediterranean campus in Menton, so this is close to Nice. It has a beach, uh, a sea view. It's uh, right behind the beach. So it's also a uh, very beautiful. Something I can tell you about the campuses is that don't imagine, as you maybe uh, already have seen from just a few photos, don't imagine like uh, big American campuses being like a city within the city or outside the city. Our campuses are city center campuses, so it's more like buildings with, of course, some outdoor space uh, for the students, uh, but uh, uh, it's not um, it's not a sprawling campus uh, on uh, a very very uh, uh, big properties, uh, etc. So that's a question that I get uh, quite often, so I'm mentioning it here. So now about the curriculum. What would students do and what would they study over the three years because we are a, a three-year program? Um, so if you have to remember only one thing about Sciences Po at the end of the presentation, it's that uh, we offer a multidisciplinary program. So it's really for students who want this multidisciplinary approach, who are interested in getting different perspectives on the world and who do not want to specialize right away. So our core courses are uh, so five social sciences plus humanities. So economics, history, law, political science, sociology. All the students have to follow these five core social sciences across the three years. So um, we really want people who are like attracted by this approach and because if you're not, if you are the type of students who already know that you want to do, for example, only economics, you would maybe not, you would probably not enjoy because you will have to study all the rest as well. Uh, so that's that's something really important to know. In case, uh, like it is the case mostly for our Indian students, not all, but most of them are not francophone at all, so they only speak English, um, which is absolutely not a program a problem because the program will be completely English taught. 
that said, we want all students at the end of the program to have uh, a command of the French language that would allow them to uh, maybe study further in French or to uh, have a, a professional uh, capacity to speak French. So it's mandatory to take French classes as a foreign language. We also have a humanities component, which is uh, depending on the semester, something like political philosophy or literature. Like if you're interested in the precise classes, you're really welcome to have a look at our, um, uh, at our website because the curriculum is really detailed and you would find every, everything. The electives, so the regional specialization is what I have already mentioned. It corresponds to the campus you have chosen. And the linguistic specialization, that I have not mentioned yet, but once you have reached a B2 level in French, um, which is like, uh, I would say, um, not being fluent, but being able to, uh, to, to speak uh, like uh, in common situations and understand everything. Um, you're able to, you're allowed to take a second foreign language. And this is also linked uh, to uh, the area of the campus. So for example, on the Europe and Asia campus, you can learn um, Indonesian, you can learn uh, Mandarin, you can learn Korean uh, as a foreign language. And then the last very important component of our bachelor program is the civic learning program. So uh, we wanted to imbibe uh, this idea of contributing to society uh, as a mandatory part of the curriculum. So the civic learning program uh, is uh, uh, basically a program that will run throughout the three years. You choose an organization that can be an NGO, that can be uh, even a, a, a company, or but an organization doing something for the public good. And you will contribute to this organization uh, by uh, working for a few hours, for example, uh, every week. And at the end of the three years, you will have to write a capstone project about what you have done uh, in the civic learning program. So I think like that's really an overview of the content. Now I can just take you through very briefly to, through the three years. The first year, you will have all these fundamentals uh, with the five core social sciences, sciences that I have mentioned before. And the second year, you will be able to customize your curriculum a little bit by choosing a major. So we have three majors, which are again multidisciplinary majors. Uh, so not like necessarily the conventional way that we understand the word major. But the first one is called politics and government, second one, economy and societies, and the third one, political humanities. For example, I'm just giving an interview, uh, an interview tip, but this is a very frequent question, question in interview. Oh, okay, so what major do we offer and uh, what major would you like to choose and why? So it's really important to already have an idea about uh, the progression uh, of the curriculum uh, because um, this is something that can be asked to you uh, from the application itself. And uh, the third year, uh, we send all our students outside Sciences Po. So uh, all the students go for an exchange program abroad uh, where they continue their major. And we have more than 470 partner universities. So of course, like, I will not give you uh, all their names, but you can know that all the best universities in the world uh, for social sciences are part of the network. And the idea is that the students uh, go to a new country, so not their country of origin, uh, to discover like a new academic system, a new culture, and, uh, um, and uh, sometimes a new language as well. So we have a lot of universities, partner universities in the US, uh, Canada, uh, in Europe, of course, because as I was saying, like we are a, a European university, so we have like signed a lot of uh, partnerships with uh, European universities, but literally all over the world. So um, 
Latin America, Africa, Asia, Australia, wherever you want to go. And students choose where they want to spend their third year abroad. So during your second year, you have to you first uh, receive information from my colleagues who organize information, information sessions. And students can select the universities they would like to join. They select six wishes and they are uh, assigned to uh, one university. So they have to follow classes exactly like local students, uh, earn good marks, credits, etc. At Sciences Po, we receive all the mark sheets, and if the results are good, then we grant our uh, degree, which is a bachelor, a BA in social science. So this was an overview of the bachelor program. I'm just going to say one word about another program, which is also very attractive. Uh, we have nine dual bachelor degrees with nine uh, partner universities. So here on the screen, uh, you can see their, their logo. Um, so what's the difference between the regular degree and the dual degree? Well, the first thing is that you get two bachelor degrees. Uh, the second thing is that the program is a four-year program instead of a three-year program. So students spend their first two years at Sciences Po and then the last two years at the partner university. And at the end of the four years, they earn like two separate degrees, uh, two BAs in social sciences. All these programs are also completely in English, except uh, the program with the Freie Universität Berlin in Germany, where uh, students have to speak German as well. Uh, so otherwise, everything, everything is in English. So this is also something like it's it's obviously very very competitive because you see uh, like uh, um, that our partner universities have equally demanding uh, admission requirements at Sciences Po at Sciences Po, uh, but I mean these are also wonderful programs. Uh, so if you want to know more so about them later on, I'll be I'll be happy to answer questions. Now, if I have some time, Kiln, you tell me if I can uh, uh, speak a little bit about the fees and uh, admissions. Um, or yeah. you prefer to, you tell me. I'm done yeah, for the content, yeah? Sure, okay. yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead, please. I think everyone will be interested in that. Yes. <laughs> so the fees. Um, so 10,700 euros uh, per year at the bachelor level. So as you can see, it's uh, relatively more affordable than a lot of even our, our own partner universities uh, in the US, in the UK, or somewhere else. Uh, that's because uh, Sciences Po is half public, half private. So uh, we have heavily subsidized uh, tuition fees uh, by, the, by the French government. So that's, uh, that's how it works. If you want to add uh, living expenses to that, it's approximately, I would say, uh, the same amount. So around 10,000 euros uh, per year for living expenses uh, encompassing everything. And um, on top of that, we have a scholarship. So at the bachelor le level, there is only one scholarship because the, the French government is not, um, is not um, delivering um, um, scholarships uh, uh, at the bachelor level. They concentrate on the master's level. So our only scheme is a Sciences Po's own scholarship called Emile Boutmi, uh, after the name of the founder. And it's a tuition fee waiver. So it's not a complete tuition fee waiver, but up to 70% of the fee of the fees can be discounted. So it means that certain students, like the students who get the maximum, they pay around uh, two lakhs, uh, two two point five lakhs in rupees to uh, attend Sciences Po. So um, so yes, I think about the scholarship. I have it, and then application process. Should I go into that? Yes. Um, so our application process, uh, it's pretty like regular. I don't think there are many surprises here. Uh, it's a two-step process. The first step is an online application and the second step is an interview. So the online application uh, for that will require uh, the documents that you can see on the screen, pretty regular again, like the resume, uh, the mark sheets or transcripts for grades 10, 11, 12. 
personal statement to academic references. Um, we don't need any SAT, we don't need English tests, uh, provided that the English test you'll be exempted if you have studied in an English medium school, which I guess is always the case for our, our candidates. And SAT, uh, you don't have to submit it unless you want to uh, appear for a dual degree with an American university and they will require it. But if you, if you apply for only uh, the regular degree at Sciences Po, we don't, we don't require it. The second step uh, is an interview. So uh, for next year, I don't know exactly yet the exact duration because usually it's a 30 minute process. And with the COVID crisis, we have like switched all the interviews remaining online and transformed it in a 20 minute process. So for next year, there are chances that we remain completely online. And uh, I cannot tell you officially because I don't have the information. So it will be either 20 minutes or 30 minutes. Um, what is assessed is, the critical thinking is very important uh, for us at Sciences Po. Your ability to put uh, uh, things in context, uh, to debate, uh, to think of the spot, and also, of course, your linguistic abilities. But I mean, generally, it's really not, not a problem with our Indian students. And after that, like after you have gone through your interview, Approximately four weeks later, you will get an unconditional offer. So we don't give the offer right away because there is a final jury which happens in Paris where uh, the jury compares like all the dim dimensions of the application, so the online application uh, and uh, the oral interview. So that's how it works. After that, you receive your offer and uh, you're ready to uh, prepare uh, to join. So I think this will be my last uh, slide. Um, I included this just to speak about the profiles of the students uh, that, that we are keen on and, uh, and who do well at Sciences Po. Uh, so I, I wrote first, you are passionate about exploring the complexity of society. So Sciences Po is really not going to give you uh, um, white or black uh, answer and uh, we see nuances we always uh, want to see the flip side of the coin and all the different aspects of a problem so I, I think that's uh, that's something that we are also looking for uh, in our students you have excellent academic records uh, because yes it's necessary to have a good grades to join Sciences Po uh, necessarily but not enough like only the grades will not get you admission uh, the rest of the profile also has to be has to be strong um, you want to build bridges between disciplines cultures when rock environments where our like curriculum is multidisciplinary we have students from all over the world, so we are of course looking for this open-mindedness also in our students. You participate in extracurricular activities, well that, that goes with uh, also the, uh, an all-rounder kind of a profile where you are not just only studying and focusing on, uh, on school. And uh, uh, maybe the most important thing, you want to have a positive impact on the world around you. We really want students who want to contribute. Uh, so they might join all kinds of careers later on, uh, but we want the common points between them to be like doing something also for others. You might be uh, uh, in a business or you might be a diplomat or you might be uh, a researcher, uh, but we want students and when they are graduates to contribute to a better world so i i think that would be my my conclusion great thank you so much sophie it has been a great refresher for me and um, yeah. uh, <laughs> it's always good to, to remember what the requirements are of different universities and i think Sciences Po is so unique that i'm glad we um kind of you know that you laid it out so clearly for us so um, I think I'm going to go ahead now and um, share my screen sure. um, and maybe ask you some questions that so, we have. So then I think I have to... No, you don't have to do anything. I think uh, okay. I just took over. Okay. 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 Perfect. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, everyone can see my screen, I guess.
Um, so yeah, um, this is, uh, again, Sophie, who I've already introduced, and her email address is here. So if you do end up having specific questions after this session that are not answered, you can always reach out to her directly. And she, uh, Sophie's based in Mumbai, so um, yes. she can speak to you at any time. <laughs> of course. Um, so um, Sophie, I think with this, uh, what's the question on a lot of people's minds now is, you know, um, with you you already mentioned that the application process has changed and now that you know you're going to get a whole new you know you guys haven't even finished i think your intake for for next for 2020 but for 2021 when you start getting those applications do you already think that there will be certain things that you'll be looking at differently or evaluating differently uh, when you're looking at student applications who, uh, of students who who've had to do their 11th grade um, in the middle of this pandemic and, and things look really different on their transcripts or in their extracurriculars. Have you, have you thought about how you'll look at those differently? So actually I'm not part of the deciding team on that because at Sciences Po we really separate people who do the promotion and help students applying like me and the admission officers. Uh, that said, um, so, the main adaptation this year, yes, I've talked about it, it's to switch all the interviews, uh, uh, of course, online and uh, making the process uh, also shorter. In terms of criteria for next year, I don't have uh, official information about that, but what I can say is that at Sciences Po, like, it's, we, we review like each application uh, one by one. Uh, there are no algorithms. Um, so it's real people looking at each application. And when the admission officers have a doubt, like they contact me, they contact my colleague Neha. Uh, so I, I don't think that anyone should be and would be penalized uh, for, uh, for the crisis uh, this year. And uh, we would certainly put some focus on keeping it, uh, keeping the process as fair as as possible so okay. that's yeah that's what I can tell because uh, right now no other precise uh, criteria which has been changed or anything like that yeah because I think students are very worried that you know they were planning to do something this summer maybe they were even planning to go to Sciences Po for the summer school I don't know or yes, you know, planning yes. something um, that they were really looking forward to as in terms of just enhancing their application and now they're not going to be able to do that so I suppose all institutions will be a little, like you said, yes. forgiving and understanding about that. Of course, of course. Okay, so my next question is, um, and I don't know how actually this is a good question because I do not actually know how Sciences Po, uh, if you guys attach any value to demonstrated interest, that is students who've been in touch with you or been to the summer program or visited the campus or shown you over the years, maybe one or two years that you know, Sciences Po is their first choice. Um, so that's really typically what demonstrated interest is. And if you do take that into account in the admissions process, will you do it differently this year? Because like I said, students can't visit your campus and they can't um, go to summer programs. Yes. So uh, there is no, um, how, how, there is no plus point for the students who have demonstrated interest uh, in the uh, strictly the admission process. For example, we don't give extra credits uh, to students who have uh, gone to the summer school. Okay. Uh, why? Because we don't want to create any uh, economic discriminations between students who can afford uh, a summer school program, for example, and students who can't afford it. So uh, there is no added value in that sense. Okay. Uh, but in a way, it always, always, always helps to be in touch with the, um, with the representatives because uh, we help students like refine uh, their objectives and uh, it's, it's, it can only help. Right. But, okay. but some students like may perfectly uh, be admitted and have never interacted with any rep, like if this is the way they wanted to go about it. Okay, I think that helps. That's good to know. Sounds very fair. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you said a little bit about what kind of student would thrive at your campus. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this question specifically, but I would, I am actually personally, um, as a counselor, very curious to know if you've had many students um, who have been uh, successful in the dual, what kind of students are successful in that dual degree program? Because that sounds extremely different and and um, can you just give us an example of a, of a student you've, um, you know of? Um, so, 
Yes, um, so the, the dual degree programs, well, the, the students I know who have uh, been accepted uh, are uh, unsurprisingly very uh, bright academically and uh, motivated also to, uh, to attend this kind of programs. I would say like that the students have to be mature because they, they, will, uh, they will go to two very separate countries, etc. And uh, uh, the difference uh, it, in the admission process is also that uh, they, they um, have to take an interview which is completely dedicated to the dual degree uh, in, uh, in which like there are representatives from Sciences Po and representatives from the partner university uh, so that they can uh, really cross uh, their, their views um, on the same applicant. So, you have to be very, very convincing. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, but also what, uh, something I can share is that every year we have Indian students who, who uh, crack uh, the admissions for the dual degree programs. And it's really selective because each program is approximately 20, 25 students max. Wow, and this is yeah. um, dual degree with programs all over the world, not just the US, not just the UK, also with so yeah, so we have uh, uh, so it was the nine universities uh, on uh, on uh, on the presentation. So we have in the U.S. Um, uh, UC Berkeley and uh, Columbia University. Yeah. In Asia, we have Hong Kong University and NUS. Uh, in Singapore, we mm. have uh, um, University of Sydney in Australia. So yeah, it's all over the world. We don't have a, a partnership yet in Africa for dual degree and uh, and uh, also Latin America is still missing but maybe it's, okay. it will come yeah okay um just want to highlight to people that you know I think that uh, and I work with students every year who are very excited about that dual degree program and then yeah. at some point they just they you know or or maybe they're just not cut out for it or whatever or at some point they kind of back away from that idea and I think it's important for everyone to realize that doing um a, that third year abroad is anyway mandatory for every Sciences Po student so yes it isn't yes. that you don't get that um exposure if you don't do if you aren't admitted to the global the dual degree program correct? absolutely absolutely yeah. that's why I, I tell students also that even the regular program will give you this international exposure it will be one year and not two years but uh, you will really uh, experience already two countries within the bachelor program okay. and also an added advantage for that if you do the regular program at Sciences Po is that you pay the fees of Sciences Po throughout whereas in the dual degree program uh, students pay Sciences Po when they are at Sciences Po for two years and at the partner university for two years so according to the partner universities for example Hong Kong University they have similar fees at Sciences Po so it's mm. uh, it's the, around the same budget, but if you take an American university, then the fees are just so much higher. Wow. And uh, yeah, and whereas if they go to an American university only for their third year, then um, they just pay Sciences Po because all our exchange programs are on reciprocity basis. Ah, okay. so we don't charge the partner university. The partner university doesn't charge us. Like it's all on a, like a pro bono um, yeah. basis. Yeah. Got yeah. it. Uh, that makes sense. That's interesting. Okay. Um, we're getting a lot of questions actually about this dual degree okay. program. <laughs> Let me go ahead in my questions and finish this up and then I'll come back to that just so that um, we don't sort of get too confused. But um, I want to, okay, so this is a question about campus safety and what uh, measures the university is taking. But what this question is really trying to address, I think at this point on um, people's minds is, what did what did Sciences Po do when the lockdown happened? When the when uh, sort of the coronavirus sort of um, panic took place across the world? Did they send students home? How did they do it? How safe were students? What was the what did the university do to help students? So uh, that I can tell you because I've been working quite a bit on it. <laughs> so the the first thing is that uh, the university uh, like closed completely. I mean physically because all the, the I mean all the employees uh, like me for example are still working, uh, but remotely. So first of all, like uh, uh, the students like went back home, uh, and all the classes shifted online. So within a week, like we organized 
organized uh, all the, the classes online because the semester was not over in France. So uh, till uh, the end of April, beginning of May right now, uh, there are still classes on and exams will be uh, end of May. So first, uh, uh, like we had to organize like the academics and uh, all the support system had to organize that. The exams will be online uh, like at the end of this month. And then we had like the students, like what to do with them. So half of them are French. Yes. Yeah. So, but we had so many, no, so half of them are French, the ones who were like in, in France, like they, they went back to their families. Uh, for our international students who were in France, uh, we've been in touch. So some of them preferred to stay uh, in France. Some of them preferred to go back to their countries. So when it was possible with, uh, with flights and all, like uh, uh, we know that approximately like uh, uh, half of them have gone back. So we have been in touch with all the students individually, sending out forms uh, uh, for us to see who was still in France, who, who was, uh, um, abroad also because we had all the exchange students abroad uh, and uh, and then we handled uh, all the cases that uh, of students who needed some help uh, individually so it was a big uh, a big operation that that uh, took a lot of time and energy for for all of us like working at the international affairs uh, department wow so, yeah <laughs> <laughs> added responsibility for you this year, I guess. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Okay, that's great. All right, well, interesting. It sounds um, like you handled it quite well. And I'm sure that, like you said, you have French students in France. You also have French students in other parts of the world. Who yes. Want to come back to France. It's like, yes, know, all over the we place. have French students in France, uh, uh, foreign students in France, and French and foreign students abroad. Yeah. And all the exchange students also. So it was really a big, uh, a big machinery. Now uh, everybody is safe. I, everybody was kind of safe throughout, but yes, there were emergency situations uh, that we had to act upon. Great. Okay. Um, this next question I think is um, one, one, you know, thing that I can say <laughs> in response to this question uh, myself is that um, one of the best ways for perfect prospective students to learn about student life and campus experience uh, for Sciences Po is to contact you. <laughs> Whenever you. I have had a student um, interested in Sciences Po, I can say Sophie is ready to come uh, to, to, the, to the student's school and sit down and talk with them for an hour and go through all of this, or rather, you know, speak directly to the, to the family or whatever it takes, right? So I think that's an amazing resource for anyone who's interested in Sciences Po. I think a lot of times students want to speak to, say, another Indian student on the campus or they want to understand, um, then maybe they want to visit. So can you talk a little bit about how a student might get to know more about your Yes. Students? So, so because of European data protection law, we have absolutely uh, no right to pass on contact details of students. So that's very strict. But a way that uh, we uh, can, and we actually encourage uh, students to get peer, re peer reviews, because this is, I think, the, the, the best opportunity uh, to, is to talk to somebody who really went through what you are going through right now. So we have a Facebook group, uh, which is called Called Sciences Po and India. Uh, I can uh, send you the link or it's really easy to find. And there we have a lot of our Indian students who are there and who are really helpful. So okay. uh, students can just post a message and generally there are uh, two or three students who are willing to help. In case like there is no reaction, we can always push and, and, uh, and just contact like separately and ask for their permission um to to students so i think that's uh that's probably the the best uh, the best way and um yeah for for student life and uh, and on campus experience like for sure that's what i recommend thank you okay um all right so i think this question you you just covered it facebook the ideal resources would be things like social media and other aspects of your website yes um, now, this is a question I think we've already covered the um, uh, sort of interview process for your university, which is unique. Um, and I think you have also covered what, um, 
is going to change about that. So I think yes. I'm going to skip uh, this question, uh, except I guess there are some questions from the audience about, or, or the participants about, um, is the, is the second part, okay, here, I'm going to read it directly. As part of the two-step admission process, is the interview selective or mandatory for all participants? Like, yes. does, does everyone have to go through it or only the ones who you, who ah, stage? Yes. No, it, there's already a first selection. Yes. Yeah, sorry, I didn't mention that. Not okay. everyone is invited for the interview. Okay. So there is already a first selection that happens at the online application. And then, uh, I would say it's not exact science or anything, but approximately half uh, the students, uh, the, the applicants would be um, would be invited for the interview. Okay. okay. All right. Uh, so yeah. Selective. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Great. Um, and then this year you mentioned. Um, did, so you did you mention about financial aid whether things are going to change this year in any way that's significant based on you know the coronavirus or any other reason. So um, the scholarship scheme that we have at the bachelor level, as I mentioned, there's only one, it's the Emil Boutmi scholarship. Mm. So we still have it for, for, for the coming year. What I can tell you for the students who are already at Sciences Po, especially for example, the ones who had to uh, come back uh, from, an, ex from a, uh, an exchange program uh, from a partner university and they were on a student budget and maybe this uh, expense was not planned. So there was, um, like social help fund at Sciences Po who helped them fund their tickets. So uh, they are, yeah, they are, we, we have this kind of relief uh, fund. Uh, the objective is that like any student who is with us like should not be put uh, uh, like in a very tight spot uh, because of uh, financial reasons. Okay, um, I have a question about that because, um, sorry, this was the question. Um, is the if a student requests financial aid in their application yes. is the process um is the process need aware is, is the if that student is not if you cannot give that student money would you admit the student anyway or would you then reject the student saying, yes uh, no, our admission process is entirely uh, need blind. So okay. students are admitted only according to their academic merit. Okay. I mean, the, the, uh, only to, according to the merit, so their profile. Uh, there is a second jury for uh, the scholarship application. So okay, they consider okay. only the admitted students who applied for the scholarship and then they will decide. But yes, we offer admission like, um, we offer admission based on the, on the profile. And then okay. if the student finds another way to fund, for example, their studies, like that way they have the opportunity to do so. Okay. So Sophie, I had more questions prepared for you, but we only have 10 minutes left. Okay. Can you believe it? Our yes. time has gone so fast. Um, yes. Anyway, let me go. So let me go to the, um, the participant questions. And one of the first ones that was asked was, um, is if a student wants to study psychology, is that an option at Sciences Po? Ah, good question. I get this question a lot. No, we don't have <laughs> psychology at Sciences Po. Very sorry. Okay. okay. Um, in good, front, that's very clear. Yes. There's no maybes <laughs> or anything. Okay. No. Sorry. Okay. Got it. All right. And then um, for, for IB students, is there a typical IB a score that you're looking for, predicted score? Uh, yes. Uh, yes. So uh, uh, for IB students, uh, the score would be around 39 out of 45. Okay. Uh, and that's a good question because you don't find uh, this anywhere on Sciences Po's website, at least for bachelor, um, for bachelor admissions. At the master's level, we have published uh, scores. Uh, but yeah, for IB students, around 39 out of 45. Okay, and I want to just piggyback on that question for a minute. If a student is not in the IB, let's say they're in the HSC yes. or CBSC or even A-levels, um, yes. and they've done, and they have not taken, let's say, a political science course or an economics or a sociology or, or history even, is that, do they need to take those subjects to be considered competitive for admission? 
So um, we don't have a required set uh, of subjects that uh, students have to take. So the objective is really to remain open to different types of profiles, different types of backgrounds. Okay. Um, but um, yes, of course, students should at least, well, I, I don't know, actually. Uh, <laughs> no, it, it depends on the academic excellence. Uh, most. I suppose they have yeah. to get through the interview. So they have to have the background yes, yes. in some way or the other, right? Yes. But for example, we have, uh, and these profiles are welcome, uh, uh, hard sciences students who join Sciences Po. Because uh, till grade 12, like they might uh, be studying maths and physics and chemistry yeah. and biology. But then thinking that finally for for their higher studies they would like to to join a social sciences course no problem at all for us uh, if the motivation is strong and uh, if uh, their uh, academic results were good i mean mathematics are always being uh, always going to be useful i mean even for economics and for all the quantitative uh, um, curriculum and uh, even afterwards at the master's level so no no problem okay um I just got another question about um, um, a program in new interdisciplinary dual degree in liberal arts and sciences, BASC. Oh, wow, somebody is really well informed. <laughs> yes, you have seen the BASC. Yes, that's uh, a, a new uh, program. Uh, so thank you to the person who, who noticed it and who di really did research before the webinar. Mm -hmm. uh, I, didn't, I didn't introduce it in the presentation because right now uh, it's not available in English fully okay. because the the partner universities in france who uh, we associated with for all the hard sciences components uh, do not offer courses in english right okay. now <clears throat> so uh, once we develop it in english like uh, i'll be happy to talk about it or if uh, the participant who asked this question is a francophone then maybe uh, they can write to me and and i would uh, I, I would help okay excellent thank you and thank you for that question, Neha. Yeah. <laughs> um, someone asked, is a school counselor um, recommendation letter required for the application? Uh, it's not required uh, because we want two subject teachers uh, to provide recommendations, but it can be uh, an extra uh, recommendation and it's always welcome. So, so you must get two subject requirements, right? Yes. So yes. Two subject um, uh, recommendations yes okay yes. in any subjects but not language right yes yes, yes absolutely yes. So, uh, <laughs> so we prefer not to have a, a language teachers recommendations not because we have anything against language teachers but because the language level can be assessed otherwise by language tests and okay. uh, and we prefer to also um, assess the ability of the student to uh, reason, to argue, or uh, um, yeah, even, uh, even maths, as I was mentioning, uh, can, can work. Uh, but yeah, we, we want that kind of perspective uh, on, uh, on the profile of the students. Okay. And um, I'm getting a lot of questions about um, that in the third year, as well as for the dual degree program, um, I think better probably to focus on the third year since everyone has to do that. But how does the student decide or how is it decided by the by the committee? You said a student chooses six, right? Yes. So how so, is it finally decided? So uh, there are criteria which are uh, published and given to the students. So of course, not everyone can go to Columbia University, for example, for their third year abroad. So certain universities which will be particularly in demand and also particularly academically uh, um, excellent, uh, will have certain requirements in terms, for example, of uh, grades, uh, of course, like for certain countries, there will be also language uh, requirements. Uh, uh, students might have uh, to, to prove their level of uh, English, for example, with an English test. Um, so, so these, um, these uh, criteria are there and uh, they have to also write a motivation letter where they explain why they uh, have chosen these universities. And it's 
based on merit. Uh, so uh, my colleagues will uh, will look at the profile and see if the choice uh, is, uh, I mean, uh, fitting the profile of the students, okay. and uh, and that's how uh, it's chosen. But something I can share is that there is really high student satisfaction because I think it's 95 percent of the students who get one of their first three choices. Okay. So yeah. Great. Um, I had a question about, um, well, someone has asked, is there a separate application for scholarships or students just need to tick a box on their main application or how do they apply for the scholarship? Uh, at the bachelor level, you need to tick a box in the application. Okay. Yes. And then um, you mentioned that like for, if a student wants to do a dual degree program, say in the US, they have to take the SAT or whatever the requirement of that university is, they have to meet that requirement, correct? Yes, yes. So is it the same for, um, specifically asking this about Germany, because they're so rigid. So with the uh, German uh, program, if a student wants to do that dual degree with... Freie uh, Universität mm, Berlin, yeah. Yeah. So or, to be super transparent with you, since I've never had uh, the case, I, I think I've, I've had the case of one or two European students who were studying in India applying for, for Berlin. Uh, I don't want to give you any wrong information, um, but uh, I, can, I can check that what are the criteria okay, for, okay. For, for the Berlin dual degree, yeah. But for Berlin, the, so is, is there any other um, university in that, in that uh, list, set of choices that is very difficult, has really high requirements that somebody should be aware of? Besides National, National University of Singapore. Okay, like, good. According, according to me, like this is the one which is the most selective in terms of grades. They are really, uh, Singapore, I, I guess it's very, very competitive yes. uh, in terms of university culture. So, uh, so yes, uh, they want almost perfect scores. Oh, wow. uh, so, so, yes, so I advise you to apply to an US, to the dual degree with an US only if you're really up there. Like yeah. uh, the, the other universities, they are more like Sciences Po. They, they look at the, at the entirety of the profile and uh, they are, yeah, more they are holistic, not so yeah. set more holistic, not so set on grades. But uh, I know from uh, my uh, admission officers colleagues that NUS is extremely tough. Yes, that is true. And if a student applies into that dual program and is not admitted to say NUS or Columbia or wherever, UCL, can they still be admitted into the three-year Sciences Po program? Yes. Okay. Fine. So I actually, these are separate applications. So okay. this is something I didn't mention. So yeah, you have to decide uh, from the beginning of the application process if you would like to join the regular program or a and or a dual degree program. Okay. Uh, and actually, I always advise students who are interested in dual degree programs to also do a regular uh, an application for the regular program because that way they can always fall back on that option and have also as we mentioned before the international exposure etc and okay. if they are admitted to both then great uh, they, they have the choice okay i think that i'm just looking through i think i have and i have um you've answered everybody's question um okay. let's see if there's anything um, okay, someone's asking, I think this is a difficult, I think, anyway, I'll, I'll ask you, um, how do students finish the core curriculum at Columbia? I'm assuming their, their requirements are slightly reduced if they're only doing two years at Columbia. Yes, so, so um, I, I, I don't think I can answer very precisely to that, but what I can tell you is that the dual degree programs, they are designed jointly by Sciences Po and uh, by the uh, partner universities. So, okay. uh, so it's really adapted to specifically uh, the, the dual degree uh, students. And uh, the objective is not to cover in two years what students study in four years. It's, it's really a combination of these two plus two that will give you the uh, two bachelor degrees. Ah, great. Thank you. That's a perfect answer. Um, I think that's it. We've answered all the questions and we are right on time. 
So is there anything you would like to say before we end this uh, webinar? Um, I think there was a question that uh, you, you had sent me to prepare uh, this, uh, this session, which was uh, uh, what uh, advice would you give uh, uh, to, uh, to students and uh, uh, want to apply to Sciences Po? So, and I guess it can be valid for any university, but I see the students who are generally, generally admitted are the ones who have really targeted very well their application. Mm. It's really like get as much information as you can, go on the website, like speak to other students, uh, write to me, uh, to also to know very sincerely, like if this is a program which is uh, uh, appealing to you, well, you would be happy. And, uh, and I think this is what, uh, really works the best because you'll be able to prepare your motivation letter, your, your statement of purpose very well, and also to be convincing uh, in front of the jury uh, because your ideas will be, uh, will be very clear. So target, target, target uh, your applications as much as possible. Thank you. That's great advice. Um, well, I'm so happy that we started off the this uh our webinar series with you and um you it's been i think a great success and we've gotten so much good information about your university so thank you again sophie and i just want everybody to know that this um webinar was recorded we will post it later on our social media and, and youtube and everything so people can access it later if they want to revisit the information or even just go back on it to get sophie's email address <laughs> <laughs> all right thank okay. you so much thank you to all the participants and thank you to red pen for organizing this i was really happy to thank you it was just a pleasure have a great day thank and you stay safe and stay thank well you. Bye. yes bye everyone bye.